Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Briglin, and this is the Thursday morning, January 21st um, edition of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, we've got a great group of guests with us uh, this morning that uh, I'd like to introduce, and <clears throat> I've really been looking forward to this discussion. Um, uh, the, the guests we have with us this morning are folks that have all testified in this committee before, and um, been having a conversation with over the last probably nine months, uh, both in committee and outside of committee about <clears throat> the discussion we're going to get into today, which um, generally speaking, I would refer to as uh, convergence. And in telecom land, I think we've talked about convergence in the last 10 years, um, kind of in the context of more specifically about um, internet connectivity. And I was thinking this morning that 10 years ago, I had um, all these different lines coming into my house. I had a copper line from Fairpoint that I would you know, pay 70 fucks, 75 bucks a month for, for, for uh, copper line service, phone service. And I had a satellite dish from DirecTV, 80 bucks a month for, for television. And I had a little dish on my house uh, for Blue Wave, which was an internet satellite service for whatever, 50 bucks a month. Um, and today I've got one line coming into my house from EC Fiber. Um, and I have voice over uh, internet protocol uh, phone service through that. Obviously I get fast internet through that. Um, I've got internet TV service all through that one line, you know, for whatever it is, 105 bucks a month and plus whatever I, pay to YouTube for, for television. But you know, it's that type of telecom convergence we've talked about a lot in this committee in recent years. Um, but this morning's hearing is about a different type of convergence, but equally important, I think, and is gonna be um, extraordinarily transformative over the next decade, which is kind of the convergence of the ubiquity of broadband internet service and um, our electrical power sector. And um, Brian Otley, who is the Chief Operating Officer uh, for Green Mountain Power, is going to be um, our first, first witness this morning. And um, Brian's going to, I think, talk a little bit about this topic. But my expectation is, and, and Brian has guided me through some of this in, in recent months, is that you know while we've focused quite a bit uh, in this committee in, in recent months about the inequities caused by um, the lack of internet service for some Vermonters for, for some obvious reasons, remote education, um, economic <laughs> opportunities, um, healthcare opportunities. There's also inequities um, caused by lack of broadband service and um, some of the energy opportunities, particularly energy, um, electrical energy opportunities. And the, you know, the massive changes that we see in power technologies coming down the road in the near future related to resiliency benefits, carbon reduction, um, and importantly, cost benefits for Vermonters. If you have a broadband connection, you are gonna have access to those um, benefits from an electrical uh, standpoint. Um, and then you know, the, the other thing that I'm really interested to hear from our guests um, on this morning is the role that distribution utilities are going to play and are playing in um, helping accelerate the expansion of broadband service in our state. Um, working with CUDs and um, in some cases, um, uh, uh, for-profit entities around the state in um, pushing broadband farther into the, the rural areas and the back roads of the state. Um, distribution utilities are gonna have uh, a, a very important role to play there. Um, so uh, our, our first witness this morning, um, Brian Otley, as I said, COO of Green Mountain Power. We also have with us um, Patty Richards, who's the general manager for, uh, for WEC, Washington Electric Co-op, and, and Barry Bernstein, who's the president of the um, board of directors uh, for WEC. And then also Carrick Johnson, who is the uh, vice president for strategic innovation for Velco. Uh, Vermont's um, uh, one transmission uh, utility. And um, I'd like to welcome you all. As I said, I've been really looking forward to hearing your testimony this morning. And um, Brian, I believe you have co-hosting ability. And um, if you wanna bring up a, um, a presentation that you're gonna share with the committee, I, 
you're welcome to do that. So anyway, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Okay, working on it now, hopefully. You'll let me know if I'm successful. Not seeing it yet. Okay, hold on just a sec. And if we need to in a pinch, I'm guessing Matthew could, could pull it up and control it uh, for you from our end. Yeah, if you're having difficulties, just let me know. Yeah, I'm struggling to be perfectly honest. I'm getting a bunch of security things. And if you could pop that up, that would be great. And for uh, for members and, and folks in the public, this is something that's on our website that you can pull up as well. So, yep, it just popped up. There we up. go. Perfect. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Um, so thanks, folks. Good morning, and uh, thank you for allowing me to join you. Um, I'm Brian Otley. I'm the COO of Green Mountain Power. Um, uh, Tim, or sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, great kickoff. Could not have uh, asked a better stage to be set, so thank you for that. Uh, Matthew, if you could go down one. So I'd be remiss without doing our little paid advertisement. Um, just for the new members who may not know exactly who GMP is, this is just a quick overview. Um, you know, we're a distribution electric utility, which means, um, you know, we're responsible for serving um, customers directly off of the poles and wires you see typically roadside. Um, we serve about 266,000 customers in almost all of the towns in Vermont, and we distribute um, about 75% of Vermont's electric load on an annual basis. We're spread out. Uh, we operate out of 15 district offices around Vermont, so we're in most of the communities. Um, that you all uh, represent. Um, we're a workforce of about five, a little over 500 uh, employees uh, with about um, 285 of those union members in the, in the local 300 of the IBEW. <clears throat> we are, uh, <clears throat> one of the things we're most proud of is our energy supply. As of today, we're 95% carbon free in the um, power mix that we distribute through uh, um, in our electricity and 63% of that is renewable. We do have a commitment by 2025 to getting to 100% carbon free or carbon free and um, and uh, by 2030 to be 100% renewable. So, um, you know, Vermont is blessed with having across all of its utilities, um, a very, very clean um, power supply that powers its electric grid. And that is one of the things we'll talk about today as to why we, we need to take more advantage of that. Um, you know, and then the, I'll wrap with uh, GMP is a little bit of a, of a weird utility, frankly. We were the first utility in the world to attain uh, B Corp certification status. B Corp is a uh, corporate certification for um, social conscious and, and environmental uh, good. And so uh, we worked with the B Corp organization, um, which had never interacted with a utility, frankly, when we engaged with them. And we were able to achieve a certification on our first year of eligibility. <clears throat> and that has provided us access to a community and a set of guidelines that continue to drive the way we think about the business and the way we think about setting our annual goals to become um, you know, more and more year after year uh, compliant with the B Corp model as it, as it relates to being a good corporate citizen. Um, Matthew, if you could go down one, please. Thank you. So uh, just as uh, Chair Brigland said, um, you know, convergence is what we're here to talk about. Um, and so uh, we have spent the last decade or so um, learning that the uh, energy opportunities in Vermont are expanded and accelerated when energy and telecommunications are paired and you can take advantage of uh, the latest clean energy technologies oftentimes located at the customer site to deliver on a higher order of goals and objectives um, on behalf of the customer that, that, that has the device at their home or at their business, uh, as well as uh, the goals of all of our customers, as they tell us, which is mostly around keeping our power supply or keeping our electric supply low cost, low carbon, and very, very reliable. So as I said, <coughs> Um, Vermont has very aggressive clean energy goals. We have, the, we have the cleanest power supply in the country, which is a huge advantage uh, from an electric standpoint. 
Um, I think it's no no uh, shock to any of you. Um, you know, over the last several years, it's, it's been quantified that tr the transportation sector, basically cars and trucks moving around the state and the th thermal heating, <coughs> heating and cooling sector, where we heat and cool our buildings, produce the largest share of Vermont's carbon emissions every year. OK, um, in other states in the country, the electric system is often a significant uh, emitter of carbon emissions uh, because their power supplies rely he more heavily on fossil fuel sources to create the electricity. Vermont is not in that situation. We've got a very clean electric sector and transportation and thermal heating cooling are the things that we hope to clean up um, to continue to reduce Vermont's impact on global carbon emissions. Um, there is a set of aggressive uh, legislation uh, in Vermont that allows Vermont distribution utilities to help our customers transition off of fossil fuels and onto our clean electric system. We're, late, we're, we're able to provide them incentives and we're able to engage them in what we call energy service programs that allow them to, to fuel switch some of their carbon-based activities over to clean electric. So an example of this would be um, if a uh, residential customer has a fuel oil furnace in their basement and they want to begin to transition off of that as their primary heating supply, uh, we have incentives to enable them to put in cold climate heat pumps, which is a technology that operate that is powered by electricity, clean electricity, and will allow them to rely less and less on their fuel oil furnace and more on the heat pump to do <clears throat> the heating and cooling within their within their building. So that's just one example of the of the ways that uh, Vermont distribution utilities are are engaging in energy services programs to help customers offset fossil fuel use. Um, we are seeing, and we've seen over the last decade, more and more what I call clean energy technologies coming onto the market that are uh, allowing customers to make these fuel choices. So battery storage systems, um, electric vehicle chargers, cold climate heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and a variety of others. These are, these are the new technologies that are arriving on the market, clean energy technologies that GMP and other distribution utilities are incorporating into their energy services programs to provide our customers with the option of uh, switching off of the traditional fossil fuel uh, sources that they have used over the years and transitioning those same functions, whether it's powering a car, um, heating, heating or cooling a home, heating domestic hot water, uh, allowing them to switch over to the clean electric source that allows them to lower their carbon emissions. Um, we expect in the decade ahead, we'll see more and more of these types of technologies emerge onto the market. We, you know, we may not know what they are today, but we know what they, we, we know there um, every day working on these on new technologies that will allow more and more of uh, whether it's the business community or the residential community to run their lives on electrically sourced uh, technologies. Um, we have also found over the last, dec last decade that these technologies del can deliver the most benefits to the grid and to our customers when they are aggregated and choreographed through broadband connectivity. So in other words, today, uh, GMP has access to, uh, I think it's roughly 15 megawatts of battery storage systems that are disaggregated out uh, among our residential customers in the form of power walls. Power walls are a Tesla battery home battery storage system and we've got, uh, well, I think we're coming up on almost a thousand installed units that allow that we can access through broadband. We can access those units and 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 use them to um, help us with peak shaving efforts. We can use those to help us with uh, planning ahead of major storms from a reliability standpoint. We can use those on heavy solar days in the summer and the spring. When we want to, when we may have a circuit that has is being has a lot of solar attached to it, and we want to absorb uh, a lot of that um, solar at a time when uh, when we can use the batteries to do that, and other things. Same thing for smart uh, EV chargers. We've got almost we're coming up uh, on almost a thousand 
uh, electric vehicle chargers that are connected to our management systems so that on a peak day, uh, at the peak time of day, we, we have agreements with our customers that allow us to call off the physical charging of their electric vehicles in their garage with their permission um, so that we can ride through a peak with, with lower, um, lower um, generation that can save money both for the customer who allows that and all customers uh, in the form of power supply savings. So to the point that uh, Chair Briglin said earlier, um, we do not have equity and equitable access to these types of programs for all of our customers. And the limiting factor to that uh, is oftentimes the availability of broadband. So the way I think about it, um, all of our customers, all of GMP operations are funded through the dollars of our customers. Okay, we're a public service entity and our operations and the services we deliver get funded through customers. We have a subset of our customers who lack adequate broadband who cannot participate in the energy services programs that we offer. So they're, they're helping to pay for these programs, but they are not able to participate in them. That's an inequity that has, been, that has only come to light in the last, I'd say, you know, less than 10 years as GMP has started to push energy services programs to the other side of a customer meter and, and use the technologies that the market is offering to create programs that can deliver power supply re cost reductions, carbon emissions reductions, reliability improvements, um, and, a, and a host of other energy system benefits. Um, but those customers that lack adequate broadband can't participate in those because we're not able to connect to those devices at their locations to incorporate those into our grid operation mechanisms. Okay, so broadband, energy, the convergence of those things has become very clear for us. And we think it will only be, it will only become more and more important in the future. Matthew, if you could go down one, please. Um, and so uh, connecting underserved broadband locations has a direct benefit for, uh, for electric customers. Okay. We've talked a lot, you know, since the pandemic hit that um, customers without adequate broadband are suffering because of telehealth uh, remote education, remote working, and a variety of other things. But there are direct energy system or electric system benefits um, that are enhanced because of broadband access. So we just talked about energy services equity. I think that is a concept that um, from GMP's perspective, we believe we have a obligation. We have an obligation to try to um, address energy services equity within our service territory and at those locations where customers uh, do not have adequate broadband in order to br bring equitable access to our energy services programs now and ongoing. Um, broadband, as I talked about, it can help reduce carbon emissions, which is a big energy uh, uh, system objective. Um, the technologies we're able to use in aggregate allow us to manage through peak events and other events that allow us to reduce the carbon emissions that um, occur as a result of the activity in our grid. Um, uh, broadband can also help us lower power supply and regional peaking costs when we can use uh, our energy services programs and the devices that are enrolled in them to manage peak days and other um, distributed generation, you know, solar type peaking events um, where we're able to absorb more um, renewable generation than we otherwise would have because of the presence of batteries and other things. We lower power supply costs and we lower our regional peaking costs. And then finally, um, in a world where all of our customer locations have adequate broadband, um, there are certain operating costs that GMP incurs that, that could be improved. One example of this, um, GMP almost 10 years ago put in what is known as an, advan an advanced metering system or a, a more, a more informally a smart meter system. That system today operates off of a, a series of telecommunica com telecommunications technologies to take the information that is measured at the meter and, and basically uh, hop it back to GMP so that we can use it for all of the things we need um, meter information for. Um, in, in several years, we'll be up to do, to do a renewal of that system. Uh, those systems typically have about a 15 year life. In a world where adequate broadband exists at uh, almost all, if not all of our customer locations, 
the technologies we would look at for that next generation metering system are going to be very different than if the situation was as it is today, where we have roughly 20% of our customer locations suffering from inadequate broadband. We can, uh, we can invest in systems that are more reliable. We can, re we can re uh, invest in systems that are likely to be lower cost. Um, so again, broadband also has some operational advantages um, uh, if it can be ubiquitous, if it can be ubiquitous within our service territory. And then, um, you know, uh, ancillary benefits, but no less important, there are some public uh, good benefit pulls through um, that are not directly related to the electric, electric system, which we've talked about, right? Pandemic has made it clear that, you know, locations that lack adequate broadband can't, can't participate in telehealth effectively. It makes remote education a real challenge and anybody trying to do rem a remote working environment um, without adequate broadband. And I know I've personally spoken to dozens and dozens of these Vermonters and been on uh, Zoom calls with them where they've had to go to the local library or some other place during the pandemic to try to get adequate broadband. Um, it can be a real challenge. So um, broadband has clear and measurable um, benefits for electric customers. Matthew, if you could get, go down one more. So what are we looking at from a gap standpoint? Um, hopefully uh, you all are familiar that DPS has done some very good work in base in quantifying what the gap is in terms of the number of locations in Vermont that lack adequate broadband. The FCC standard for broadband is defined right now as 25 megabits per second download speeds, three megabits per second upload speeds. There are, uh, based on the, on the most recent DPS study, about 69,000 locations in Vermont that lack that. Um, there have been some public funding opportunities to close that gap. Um, the state of Vermont, put, through the CARES Act, put out connectivity, connectivity initiative grants uh, in the latter part of last year. And the Federal Communications Commission did uh, what was known as their RDOF auction at the end of the year as well, which provide, on paper anyway, funding for some of those 69,000 uh, 69, locations. So after those two funding opportunities today, best information we have, there's about 46,500 Vermont locations that do not have a clear path to funding to be connected at the FCC standard. We're, we estimate based on our look at the data, about 54% of those locations exist in GMP territory. So a little over 25,000 and a little more than 75, hundred of those, about 30% of those locations um, have current connectivity speeds below 41 megabits per second, which is just awful. It's, it's, it's essentially unusable for anything um, that you would want to do from a telehealth, from a, um, you know, telecommuting, teleeducation, whatever. Um, these are the locations today that do not have access to GMP's energy services programs because the lack of reliable bandwidth prevents them for, from participating um, in those programs. So that's, that's at, the, at the worst edges of our service territory, those 7,500 or so locations, those are the ones we're talking about really suffer from what we call the, the energy services inequity. Matthew, if you go down one, please. So how do we think we can help? You know, you'll hear from Patty Richards right behind, right after me, and you may hear from some other distribution utilities. We we all have may have a slightly different view of how we think our organizations can help. That those views are generally informed by the unique differences <clears throat> that exist in our service territories, the demographics of our customers, the geographic locations we serve, um, and the the broadband footprint that exists in our service territory today. So from a GMP perspective, what we've been working on, and we think the focus of our work um, uh, in the short term is on what we call figure, what we call addressing the make ready obstacle to broadband expansion. Make ready is a term we use um, to describe uh, construction work that needs to be done on our poles in order for a new attachment to be made to those poles. So if you think about it, you know, we've got poles all over our service territory and there are both a, on many of those poles, most of those poles, there are electric wires. And then there are these other wires that you see. Those other wires are almost always telecommunications wires. They may be copper wires carrying voice. They may be 
uh, uh, coaxial cable wires ca carrying um, data and other things. They may be fiber, fiber, fiber optic cables carrying uh, voice data or, or, any, or any other, any other uh, telecommunications media. In order for, for new attachments to be made against those poles, those companies need to make an application to the pole owner in this in our service territory GMP. And then we go out, do a survey, make sure the, the poles from an engineering standpoint are appropriately um, tall, are appropriately um, structurally, structurally sound, and there's enough spacing on the pole for that attachment to happen. Where there need to be changes to poles, we make those changes to accommodate that new attachment. That's expensive work um, and it's very variable work. So um, one of the things we've learned, actually, if, Matthew, if you'd go down one slide, I think I have more detail here. Yep. So in, in we've been talking to broadband companies for the last six months, trying to figure out how we can be most helpful to them. The make ready cost is, is it can be anywhere from 10 to 25% of total project capital cost, depending upon the nature of uh, their network expansion project. It's also very variable. From one project, it can be, you know, less than 10%. In the most extreme projects, it can be up to 40%. So um, it's one of the most difficult things to forecast and to estimate until you actually go out in the field and do the engineer, engineering survey, survey to do that. Make Ready has been identified for us as a as a significant obstacle, both because of the the amount of the capital and the variation, which makes it very difficult for these broadband companies to estimate that uh, and then have credible data to go out when they raise capital um, to to be able to characterize what the project economics are going to be when that Make Ready variable is hard to pin down. Um, so we're really focused on, on figuring out a way to do that. We have a notion that we've been um, running around talking to broadband providers, distribution utilities, and some of the telecommunications leaders in the state of um, GMP offering some sort of a cost relief or cost incentive against make ready costs uh, for telecommunications projects that will bring acceptable broadband connectivity to those unserved locations in our service territory. Um, we've been working with the department on how we can, um, you know, construct a program um, within the current regulatory and statutory framework that would be acceptable um, to regulatory precedent, but also be constructive and helpful to broadband providers to, to accelerate and expand um, their, their, basically their infrastructure build out uh, in our territory to reach those worst of the worst, less than 4-1 locations. We think that in reaching those less than 4-1 locations, about 7,500 of them, you will probably pass many of the other locations that are considered underserved. You know, they may be a little better than 4-1 or they may be 4-1, but, but they're not up to the 25-3 FCC standard. So we're hoping by offering some sort of a cost incentive program out to those worst of the worst locations, we can jumpstart more um, deployment into those rural areas that have been hard to reach so far. We're working actively on that and we hope to have um, something in front of folks uh, you know, shortly that would be a what we would consider a, a well vetted strong proposal um, to have some sort of a make ready cost incentive uh, available to telecommunication providers. So I'm going to stop there and uh, open it up for questions. If folks want to discuss discuss this further, I yield back to Chair Briglin. Um, I've got a quick question, Brian, just kind of a clarification. In, in terms of the make ready work that you talk about um, and, and, you know, potentially partnering uh, with uh, internet service providers and working with regulators on cost recovery and things like that, but the make ready work itself, is that something that would be done in a highly planned way with ISPs? Would it be done, I don't know what the, um, almost preemptively, if you will, uh, you know, kind of opening the space, the make ready work has been done here, who wants to come in? Um, how choreographed would that be ahead of time versus kind of laying the groundwork, if you will, for yep. whoever is gonna, you know, come in? Yep. So the, the there's 
it depends on, 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 there's no right answer to that. You, you can do it any way you want. There is a challenge in doing it ahead of a telecommunication provider's expressed expression of interest to go to a location because you, you may get into a situation where it's build it and they will come. And if they don't come, that's a challenge. Okay. From a, from a regulatory standpoint that, that there's a precedent for that, that, that is a challenge. Um, in terms of orchestrating, one of the things we've been we've been doing is, you know, it's it's not it's it's no coincidence that the areas of the state that ha at least in our service territory that have the worst broadband also happen to have typically not it's not one for one but but it's thematically correct. They also happen to have some of the worst electrical reliability at the same time. These are the rural parts of the state, hard to reach, low density. The electrical infrastructure in terms of the age of the poles and the wires tends to be older in those areas. The incidence of outages and the outage statistics tend to be higher. And so, you know, GMP is in the middle of, of our, what we call our climate plan, which is an accelerated resiliency investment program to rebuild the distribution lines in, in many of these areas of the state. And we think, and we've been working with some of the telecommunication providers to, as we rebuild these older lines, and, and bring them to modern construction standards and, and perhaps take them out of, the, out of the field and bring them roadside at the same time, do not only the, the make ready work, but actually do the telecommun telecommunication transfer work so that you have one set of crews, one set of traffic control uh, uh, people, you're doing the, the electrical work and the telecommunication work at one time and, and using the most efficient set of resources uh, you can to get that section done, not only from an electric standpoint, but from a, from a communication standpoint. That I think is the real opportunity. Um, it's difficult to coordinate all of that work together, but I think with the transparency we'd like to bring, there's a real opportunity to do it. That, that's helpful. Um, I don't see any other hands up at the moment, um, but you know, uh, I'm sorry, Lucy. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Representative Rogers. Thanks. I was just organizing my thoughts. Um, thank you for presenting. I, I, I think it makes total sense. There's so much overlap and parallels between the need for electricity and the need for broadband and the ways that they can benefit each other. Um, I guess I just had a couple questions. One was do you see any changes you would need from in statute or from us in order to support your interest in, in, in helping with the make ready costs and the make ready process? Uh, right now we, we are, we are mapping out a, um, a regulatory path to try to get um, review and approval for this. Um, so, so you asked me the question today. My answer is I, I'm hopefully I'm hopeful we don't need a legislative path on this. We would always love legislative support. I'm not sure exactly the form that that takes or looks like, but um, we we do think we have a, a reasonable regulatory path with the Public Utility Commission to seek review and approval for um, the ideas we're we're firming up. Um, so that's that's the way we're looking at it today. Okay. Thanks. And then my other question is, I guess I, in my understanding of the electric co-ops and then my knowledge of the CUDs, um, it, it seems like there's just such a large amount of overlap in the, in the missions of really being the electric co-ops for electricity being the way to ensure that every household is served and, and that um, the mission is really based in the public good and, and in um, local uh, control and and ownership and decision making process and, and that seems quite parallel with the CUD model. So I'm curious if you see a difference or a prioritization in supporting the make ready work for the CUDs that are working with such a overlapping and similar mission to the co-ops or if you see this being kind of a across the board policy. So I, I, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, we've spent a bunch of time with uh, various CUDs and the CUD coalition as well, trying to, you know, vet different ideas and get feedback on how to be constructive on this. I do see a, I do see a, so, so let me step back. We view CUDs as both enablers to broadband and potentially even being ISPs themselves. So, 
CDs can have multiple roles within their territories and each of them, um, when we talk to them anyway, expresses, you know, slightly different views of what they think their forward trajectory and their future plans will be. Um, but, you know, we view them as both a, an enabler, a partner, um, as well as a potential provider, which is great. Um, anything that we would put together, you know, our, our top mission is to, is to try to cause connectivity to be built to these locations. And if that can be done, you know, directly through a CUD, that's terrific. If it can be done directly through a commercial provider, that's terrific. Our goal is to get these locations connected. I do see a really valuable role with the CUDs, um, you know, in addition to, to, to their other work and aspirations of being kind of a verifier on the ground. So, um, you know, what we don't want to do, we want to, we want to avoid any chance that uh, a developer would access funds that we may make available and then either not deliver on the commitments or, or deliver on commitments that are less than expectation based on the, on the, on the funds that they've accessed. And so the CUDs know their territories better than anyone. They know what the current connection speeds are within their territory. They know, um, you know, what, what, um, broadband uh, infrastructure exists on the roadways and what doesn't. Um, and so I see a partnership opportunity with the CUDs to be kind of the verifier of the truth on the ground of what construction has happened and when retail broadband services become available at the locations that are being targeted as a kind of a checkpoint before any funding is signed off on. Um, for, for the developers that, that seek to access it. So that could, be an, that could be a CUD accessing the funding themselves if they're doing those builds. It could be the CUD serving as a, a truth teller or a fact checker to a, a commercial telecom who's accessing the funds and doing the build. Um, but I, I do see a valuable collaborative role for the CUDs in the uh, rollout and administration of, of something like this, absolutely. That's helpful and clarifying. Thank you. I think I can, I, to, to ask the question a little bit more specifically, I think where, where I was really getting at with that is the electric co-ops understand deeply the importance of commitment to serving everybody as do the CUDs. And what would be the commitment to supporting make ready work that supports broadband build out in a method or in a way that then supports and enables um, broadband access to every address as opposed to supporting make ready work in a way that may actually in the long term jeopardize build out rec with the recognition that that could be through a private company or through a CUD but but that certain designs of private companies would then jeopardize the mission of getting broadband to everybody in the long term does that does am I asking that in a way that Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think I get it. Um, I mean, the, 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 the problem we're in today is a result of broadband companies effectively cherry picking routes to, to what are, you know, deemed the most profitable locations, right, and ignoring the others. Um, you know, the co-ops, the co-ops are no different than GMP. We, we all have an obligation to serve all of our customers in all of our locations with electric service, right? We don't, none of us have the ability to pick and choose on the electric side. That has not been the case on the telecommunications side. And that's part of the reason we're in the, you know, we have the, we have the connectivity gap that we have today. You know, our hope is, is that between, between the, the capital of the, of the CUDs and, and commercial telecoms paired with oversight, of the CUDs and the folks that are on the ground locally that will be able to manage, um, you know, and again, paired again with an, a potential um, cost incentive that is only applicable to those locations that are the worst of the worst, right? That that is the way you're gonna spur development to, to, the, to the hardest to reach locations. I'm not sure it's, it's a perfect system or a perfect solution, but I think it's, the, as we've thought it through, it's, it's the one we feel good about balancing the interest of speed, um, you know, getting further into these, these locations while also 
um, responsibly safeguarding electric customer dollars um, in doing it. I mean, one thing I probably should say is, you know, GMP, we work really hard every year to try to take cost out of our system, out of our delivery. We, we want our rates to be as low as they can be for our customers. And so we safeguard against, you know, unnecessary or, or imprudent cost increases at every turn. I mean, we, we are laser focused on that. We had a lot, we've had a lot of internal debate about, should we be, you know, should we be um, rationalizing additional customer cost on the electric side in, a, in, a, in the hope of, yeah, solving energy services equity, but also, you know, but it's applied to telecommunications infrastructure. That's not an easy decision for someone like us to make. Um, this is a time when we want to keep electric rates as low as they can to continue to accelerate the transition off of fossil fuels. We want to sunset fossil fuels. We want to increase electric because that's the, the climate the, the climate solution that, that we're looking for to try to be the good steward uh, in global emissions. But we think all things considered, there are, there are enough benefits um, to undertaking these costs and that we'll get paid back on that through, you know, carbon emission reductions and power supply cost uh, reductions and things like that, um, that it makes sense at this time. That's helpful. Thank you. I think, um, thank you. I'll, I'll end just by saying, I'll, I'll use my hometown as an example, because it's actually not in Green Mountain Power um, territory, which is Waterville, but I, I would imagine it's quite similar to many of the rural towns. And I definitely appreciate the emphasis on make ready work for unserved and underserved areas. Um, my town of Waterville has currently in the, at least as of two years ago in the public service department maps had zero addresses that were served with broadband and in that in that way, every address would be considered high priority. And like many Vermont towns, it has, you know, a main paved main road right down the middle with a lot of houses on it. And then all of the back roads kind of spreading right. out from there. So if it were in Green Mountain Power territory, and if Green Mountain Power were to support the make ready work of a, of a company coming straight down the, the main road, um, that would be long-term one of the worst things that could possibly happen for being able to achieve universal service. It would basically make it impossible for the back roads of my town to ever receive universal service. And so that's where I was just, that's where I was coming from with, with that is, um, you know, even though every single address along that, that main road would be a priority unserved or underserved address because no addresses have broadband, just, just making sure that there's some degree of Right. you know, conscious build. And it seems like you're doing that. And it seems like collaboration with the CUDs could be a really great opportunity to, to be a little bit more conscious in the, in yeah. the way it felt out. So I will, um, thank you. And, and thank you chair for, for letting me engage in that for, for a little bit. No, I mean, I, I think your, your hometown is a, uh, is a great example, Lucy, of how, you know, at a high level, um, you know, doing, uh, doing that good work um, could actually have negative ramifications. Um, I mean, this is something that, that I think a lot of rural towns are, 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 um, are facing. So um, I think it's a great example. Um, I don't see any other questions for Brian. Um, Brian, I'm hoping you can stick with us um, when we kind of get through um, all, all of our uh, guests. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, I spoke too soon. Go, go ahead. Representative, <clears throat> this isn't a question for Brian, but it's just uh, I know your son Cole is uh, looking for an internship, and uh, I just uh, wanted to let you know that if he wanted to, he could tune into uh, our committee hearings, um, even today, uh, by going to the uh, the committee website and uh, clicking on the live stream link. Okay, thank you, Mike. Yeah, just uh, my my son's a, he's in college, and COVID disrupted his semester schedule, so he's off this spring he's actually in the middle of a january class a january term right now but he's he uh without a lot of notice he was told uh you know hey you're not going to be on you're not going to be here for spring semester or taking classes spring semester so we're doing a little bit of scrambling with some of this this wow. COVID stuff never ends never ends yeah yeah the tuition bill will still be there though so. oh every time every time yeah. um so we're going to move to um uh, to the folks uh, who are here from Washington Electric Co-op, we've got Patty Richards, the general manager, and, and uh, Barry Bernstein, who's the 
um, president of the board of directors. Um, I'm going to hand the, uh, the torch over to you guys now. And, um, you know, to, to, to um, I know that you're working on some very specific strategies uh, within your um, geographic footprint on, on, on broadband. Um, really eager to hear about those and, uh, and welcome. Thanks for, for being here, both of you. Thank you very much for having us. Um, Barry and I will probably tag team this. I'm Pat, for the record, I'm Patty Richards, the general manager at Washington Electric Co-op. Um, I'll start out and I'm sure we'll do some tag team along the way and welcome questions. Let's have this as a conversation. Um, I do not have slides to put up, so hopefully uh, a talking head will be fine for the next several minutes. Um, but really want to thank Brian Otley from GMP for teeing this up. I thought he did a fantastic job kind of framing it setting up some of those uh, basic parameters of what's you know, low speed uh, internet service. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, where we are at Washington Electric Co-op. Um, as Brian did, I'm gonna just start with basically some basic facts about who we are as Washington Electric Co-op. Um, and Representative uh, Rogers, I really wanna thank you for the, uh, for the co-op comments um, in terms of mission driven, you know, making sure we pick up all of our membership base, um, that's really gonna dovetail well with what we talk about here from Washington Electric Co-op. So just a little backdrop, uh, WEC was established in 1939. Uh, we're gonna go back 80 years ago to the electric model. Um, we picked up consumers that were just like Representative Rogers indicated off the main road. So at the time the investor owned utility said, oh, it's not economic to go reach back into those hills and on the dirt roads. And we're not gonna pick those consumers up with electricity 80 years ago. So a bunch of um, hardworking Vermonters got together and they said, we want electricity on the hills. We want electricity in our houses way off the main road. And they established WEC with 150 customers to start. We are now roughly 11,000 customers, 11,000 meters. We cover 41 towns in the state. That's roughly 17% of the geographic area of Vermont, but we are small. We're less than 2%. We're 1.3% of the energy use of the state of Vermont. We are the most rural utility in the state. I just wanna put that kind of bounding on it because we are, you know, we are the hills, we are the dirt roads. And my rule of thumb, uh, coming into WEC, learning quickly, if it's on pavement, we don't serve it. <laughs> uh, so we're definitely very rural. Um, and our membership, um, uh, not, we're 96% residential. So very little commercial industrial load. It's primarily houses. Um, we are a not-for-profit. We are owned by our members. So, so the co-op mission is about serving everybody. We're very, very much, um, uh, mission driven. We have a nine member board of directors with they're democratically elected. They fill uh, three year seats and we have an election every year and we conduct annual meetings and our membership drives through voting and uh, directors and feeding us comments. They drive our policies and our where we head into the future. So we're very much consumer driven, member driven, and our goal is to serve everybody in our in our rate base, our membership base. So we have, so that's just a little bit about the co-op, you know, and again, I really wanna just stress that we're super rural. Um, so going back to that electric model 80 years ago where, where electricity was not provided, that's where we are right now with broadband. It's, it was not perceived as economic for the for-profit uh, internet providers, high, uh, broadband providers to come into our service territory. The, the Department of Public Service has done some work for the state in our service territory, 75% of the rate base, the consumer base is underserved with internet. That's three quarters of our membership. So we have this giant gap in terms of who has internet and if they have internet, it's usually very slow internet. So they're either underserved or completely unserved. We have a giant gap. So basically I'm setting the stage of 
WEX infrastructure needs to pick up our entire membership base for internet is significant, it's big. And it's very much similar to where we were 80 years ago in providing electricity. So where we are today, um, we have been studying uh, the costs and benefits and how we would pursue broadband in our service territory. I mean, we, we've been working with a consultant um, to map this out. And we've figured out a path forward. And our strategy is not necessarily WEC being the internet service provider, not being the actual uh, company that takes the phone call from the consumer in terms of internet, but we can provide the backbone. We could string, we own our poles and our infrastructure and our service territory, 95% of the poles we own. And our business model that we are looking at is that WEC would deploy and be responsible for the fiber backbone which is the middle mile, we'd be the carrier, kind of like the state roads, so to speak, of internet. And then we would partner with CUDs and let them be the internet service provider. So basically taking from our pole to a house, the CUD would be responsible for those infrastructure drops. And we would be stringing fiber all around our service territory on the poles, but they would be the actual internet service provider to the customer. So we're looking at a partnership model. The total cost to bring internet service to the unserved um, areas of our territory, and we're looking at about, like I said, 75% of our service territory needing infrastructure upgrades because it's just there's nothing there for them. Um, we're looking at roughly a 30 to $33 million price tag. If WEC is providing the backbone, for that, that's roughly somewhere in the 23 to 25 million. A dollar mark, and then the CUD would pick up the residual, the eight million to ten million for the internet service drops from our pole to the house. So, we're, so again, WEC is looking at a partnership model, and our our structure is uh, if we're going to build twenty three million dollars of infrastructure, and we're going to partner with the CUDs, um, we're going to work with uh, low cost financing from the rural utility services, which is the federal government in terms of that's how we borrow. And we would get low cost, um, low interest rate money from the our US um, facility, the, our US folks. And that would allow us to build out our $23 million worth of infrastructure. And then once we build that infrastructure, then the CUDs have some, something to tap into and then they would put their infrastructure um, onto our backbone and serve the, co the consumer members. We would work hand in hand with the CUDs to make sure that we're doing this in concert so that we're picking up the consumers along the way. So our goal is to pick up the, um, predominantly the entire um, WEC membership that is underserved or unserved in our service territory. Um, this, one of the things that we are looking for as we explore this model is we're trying to minimize the impact on the electric consumer in terms of rate pressure. The last thing we wanna do is have a giant rate increase to fund this. Um, and one of our asks that we are looking at for legislative help is a tax exemption, a property tax exemption on any new infrastructure, not any existing electricity infrastructure, any new broadband infrastructure we have to roll out to pick up unserved or underserved, we'd like to have a tax exemption for that. And the reason for that is it basically will make our economics rate neutral, very close to rate neutral on the electric side. So if we get a tax exemption, we would avoid roughly $500,000 a year. Of, we, would, we would not have that added expense. That money makes our cost benefit, um, our cost infrastructure rate neutral by not having a property tax expense. So it's really an important thing for us. So we are advocating um, in this legislative session to get that tax exemption again, and this is on new broadband infrastructure in the unserved, underserved areas of the state. 
And I think with that, um, I'll ask Barry if he wants to add to this and then we can open it up to questions. Thanks, Patty, that was, that was great. I'll just, uh, I'd like to start with saying that if you have any co-op questions <clears throat> outside of this meeting, you have Mr. Co-op, uh, not just electric co-op, but total lifetime involved co-op in Representative Pat, who is our general manager for 20 years and also our, served on our board of directors and has been actively involved in the food co-op movement and the housing co-op movement. So uh, I just, you've got a great resource there. Um, <clears throat> and I also thank Brian for laying things out. Our board was trying to see what part we could play in helping to expedite getting high-speed internet to our, all of our members, at least having it available to them, um, and building on the incredible work that's been done by many of our members but uh, who are on the CUD boards, um, starting with e EC Fiber, who was the early uh, developer of, of this, um, we weren't into competing. And one thing we CUDs have, as Representative Rogers pointed out, we have a common goal. We are not trying to make money on this. We are trying to make sure we, we don't lose money on it. And under state regulations, we're not allowed to cross subsidize. <clears throat> so that's, that's extremely important for us. Um, we finally got to the place where we, and that number that Patty's using a percentage is about, it's over 8,000 members in our co-op who, who have inadequate or, or um, very limited high-speed service. We're gonna, we, we will do a couple of things. By borrowing that money instead of the CUDs borrowing it, we take that load off of them and having to go to the, as uh, Carol Monroe and Stan Williams pointed out to you, having them go to the municipal re revenue bond market. So that allows them a little bit more ceiling in what they're doing. What we're gonna do, and we've been meeting regularly with uh, both CUDs in our territory, uh, any case uh, fiber represents five towns, but they're fairly new, so we really haven't, had much conversation with them recently, particularly because of the RDOF restriction I'm talking. They were not in our consortium. So we've been working with both CUDs, ValleyNet, which is the ISP for e EC Fiber, and also with Kingdom Fiber, Michael Birnbaum and his, his group, that although they're for-profit, they've been, Michael's been committed um, for a long time. It is an, an, a WEC member and also on the uh, CB Fiber board. So we'll lease that back to them. And by, by being able to access our US money at under 2% for 35 years, if we can get an exemption, and when Patty was talking about um, uh, infrastructure, we're mainly talking about the fiber. We would string that fiber on our poles and then lease it back to them at less of a rate than they can go borrow that money and build it themselves. So that's a win for them. We will be jointly marketing to our members with them because we want our members to have that access. That's gonna be another benefit for, for both of us in trying to serve our members. So we really, the, the, I wanna point out a couple of things about what we're asking. We're asking for, when we say property tax exemption on that new fiber, this is, this is right now the, the uh, CUDs are not paying property tax. So they're, they're made up of municipals who serve the municipals. Um, and so we're not asking to take away anything from the property tax base. We're just asking everyone to realize that if we can get this fiber build out in the next four years, uh, 24, 25, we, we hope if we can, uh, that it will help keep younger people at home, not moving out of state, and people are wanting to move in because of the COVID uh, change of lifestyle, et cetera, and work at home, that's gonna improve the property back tax base for everybody. Because right now people aren't, aren't coming to our areas. If they, the first thing they find out if they're looking at a house, what are they, 
they don't want to get into Tim's previous situation of having four different uh, monthly bills in what's going on. Um, we're also 100% renewable and have been for quite a while. Um, our Coventry land and 85% of our, uh, our power sources are from in-state. 15% is from the hydro, New York hydro power, which we've been getting power from since the, the mid 50s. So I, there's nobody in the country is in a better situation than we are. And we have long term contracts and own a good part of our our generation. So that's a big ask for us. But we're going to pass that on the property tax. We're going to pass that directly back to the CUDs. So it lower, lowers the cost even farther. The economics are that if we don't get that, we are not going to be able to most likely uh, be a partner with uh, the CUDs if they're not paying the property tax because it's adding another burden to them. So we're working with both CUDs. We expect we'll have some uh, relationship with uh, NEK Fiber, uh, Kingdom Fiber, probably Waitsville T Telecom, which serves part of our territory, and Topsum. We, you know, we'll we'll be working with everybody who's there. We we made a decision, even though it would have been more economically profitable, not to try to be the ISP, not to take on that load. And so I'll leave it at that. And if you have any questions, but I the, the I will make one other comment. The 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 a solution that Greenmount Power is talking about in terms of make ready that doesn't work for us because we are gonna be doing all of that make ready as part of our complete build out. So it'll be part of our uh, long-term financing and it will be capitalized costs as opposed to expense costs. One other comment I just wanna make cause I know Carol and um, Stan made it yesterday is in, in our situation, um, our union employees will deal with putting the fiber on et cetera. But presently, what happens if uh, consolidated, if we put a new pole in it and they have to move the wire, we have an arrangement where they will come and, and deal with that. They're a union shop also. So you have the issue of not wanting to uh, get involved in another union replacing one union's work. Um, where Eustace does the work and they will probably be the company that uh, lays our fiber on our poles. If they're doing that and they have an arrangement with Consolidated, that that's a, an a advantageous situation, but I, it's not gonna be the same for, there are about seven or eight uh, independent companies that also have fiber, uh, have uh, access to our poles at this point. So I'll leave it at that and see if you guys have any questions for us. Great. We are definitely, you, by Penny. the way, going, yeah. let me just say, we are definitely going ahead with applying for our loans now and hope if we can get approval by October, we would start to um, see that fiber build out. It will be in very close coordination with the CUDs. We won't do anything without that, without a cooperative agreement with them, which we're, we have, we have drafted at this point. So th thank you, Patty and Barry. Um, we do have some questions in the queue here. Um, so I wanna call on members. Um, uh, first representative Sibelia, then representative Sims, representative Yantovka, representative Pat. So we've got them stacked up on the runway here. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the presentation. I actually have four questions. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I the, the first is um, around uh, WEX formation, and uh, if that was around the time of our country's rural electrification, uh, both the federal uh, activity that happened there, uh, if, if that was part of WEX formation. Um, the second question, uh, I heard uh, Patty talking about, uh, uh, about WEC not wanting to be an ISP and working with the CUD. Uh, and so I'm wondering if that, uh, in, in this scenario, are you are you working with an additional um, ISP? So will there be three partners or are you anticipating just the two, uh, the utility and the CUD? Uh, my third question, sorry, <laughs> is around uh, the financing that WEC will be 
um, accessing to string the fiber. I'd just like to understand a bit more about um, where that will come from, what makes you eligible uh, to borrow it, what types of terms you're looking at. Uh, and my final question is, uh, if the General Assembly were to put in place uh, some sort of a tax exemption as you have been asking for, uh, do you think that that uh, fiber um, should <clears throat> be held publicly um, by a municipality or, or another entity dedicated to the public good going forward? Or is that something you would envision being acceptable to have sold to a private company going forward? I know those are a lot of questions. Um, I'm in a noisy place. So I wanted to get them out and now I'm going to mute myself. Patty, you wanna go first and yeah. take I'll jump in. So the first question regarding WEX formation uh, relative to um, the rural electrification build out, the answer to that is yes. WEC um, was incorporated in 1939 as were other co-ops across the nation. So I hope that answers that question. Um, the second question was, um, related to WEX not wanting to be an ISP and partnering with uh, CUDs. Sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> um, we are envisioning a two entity partnership. So WEC being the backbone and then the CUD, uh, with the CUD being um, the, the face and the, the hand holding to the actual customer. So a, a two entity partnership versus three. I'm not aware of where a third entity would fit in that, but our model right now is based on a, uh, we would be the backbone middle mile and the CUD would interact with a consumer, um, you know, for billing purposes, answering phone calls, um, and our, any internet service questions. We're okay. literally just the backhaul. We would kind of be like, um, so that answers Patty, the second me, question. The third yeah, question was Patty, let finance. Me just, uh, Patty, let me just add one thing on that. Actually, um, there will be third parties, but the, okay. for instance, for instance, with uh, EC fiber, uh, they have their own ISP, which is ValleyNet, which they're very, they're linked. C, um, CV Fiber is still trying to figure out uh, who they will work with. They might work with two or three different ISPs because they're serving more towns. They, they may work with Waitsville Telecom. They might work with, and probably will work with Kingdom Fiber. And they also will work with ValleyNet because all, all three of them are working, uh, at least ValleyNet and Kingdom Fiber and CV Fiber are all working to serve some of CV Fiber's uh, territory. So it's, it's, it's not really just cut and, cut and dry on that one. Patty, go ahead. I'm okay. sorry. I didn't Thanks, want Barry. To, yeah. um, in terms of the financing, rural utility services is part of the uh, federal government's uh, Department of Agriculture. And as part of being um, electric cooperative and rollout of the cooperative, we get access to funds because of our cooperative status. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question or not. If you want me to go into more on that, I certainly can. Patty, let me just say what, what ha what's happening is we're borrowing that money from our US, which used to be uh, REA. Um, it all came out of FDR's uh, Rural Electrification Act in 1936. Um, and um, so we'll be borrowing through that, but we're going to be borrowing for that fiber for our electrical system. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg, but they do allow us, they do allow us then to lease it out. What's happening to us, and this is a decision the board ha ha had to make and has to make, but we're moving on this premise, is that even though, as, as Brian mentioned, we probably wouldn't have to do this fiber build out at this pace right now because we probably get five, six years more of, in quotes, uh, the life of our uh, AMI automatic meter infrastructure uh, still left. Um, we feel we can go ahead and do this 
and borrow it. Right now, the rate's 1.6% interest rate for 35 years. So that's that. we're going to pass that savings on into our lease price with the ISP CUDs because we're just trying to make sure we have that debt service at this point. So I just, if that, if that clarifies it a, a little bit, uh, I'll let it, Patty. It does. It does. I just want to, I just want to re clarify that question. So sure. you are borrowing from RUS uh, to, for reliability for your electric network. Right. And as Carol, and, as Carol and Stan pointed out for them to go do it, it's a lot of new paperwork that they haven't had to do. We do this every four years. So we're, we're, we have the information are on top of it and have hired uh, a local engineering company to work with us along with the National Rural uh, Telecommunications uh, Co-op to help us with that four-year fiber build-up work plan, which will be on top of the four-year other electrical work plan that we do. So hopefully that's not too confusing. Patty, go ahead, you should, because Laura had another question. Okay. So the last question regarding uh, tax <clears throat> exemption, why, WEC is a not-for-profit. So we, there is no uh, profit piece in here for our portion of the borrowing that we do. Um, and that's part of the reason why we have access to the Rural Utility Services, our US financing. So as a not-for-profit, we're, we're doing this to extend infrastructure versus trying to make money off of it. And like Barry said, what we're trying to do is, is pass on um, just, a, just our actual cost to the CUD so that we can drive the cost to the, ultimately to the customer when it get the internet um, service gets to the customer as low as possible. We wanna make sure this is affordable so people uh, take broadband service up from the CUDs um, that partner with us. So the second part of Laura, I believe your question was, how do we feel about it towards the, the privates? I, I wanna just clarify, we're asking for, to have an exemption on any new fiber. It won't be if we are replacing a pole uh, because we have to replace a pole. We're still gonna, that's still gonna be part of our electrical infrastructure because it's gonna be existing. Um, the, it, it's kind of tricky. Normally I would not support conceptually uh, giving uh, privates the same benefit. But what you're trying to do is lower that cost to the ultimate consumer or rate payer uh, who, doesn't, who has inadequate fiber. And any, uh, if that exemption goes across the board to co-ops and whatever, munis and, and Green Mountain Power, if, if in some way it's clear that they're gonna pass that cost on, that cost savings on directly to the CUD ISP or to the ISP to the customer, uh, then it benefits all of us in making sure we finally reach this goal of 100% conductivity for every Vermont household. Uh, and I think in, in, in that manner, it's extremely important to do it for everyone. So, and again, I, I want to underline, we're not taking away anything from property tax. We're going to be enhancing the ability of the future property tax to, to grow. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, state that I'm not opposed to that conceptually. Uh, I am very concerned about public investment going to, uh, to fund these extraordinarily difficult and expensive projects that we've called on now uh, our regulated utilities and volunteers to put together and then having the benefit of those public funds ultimately end up uh, in, in private for-profit companies' hands who have not been part of this solution. So thank you, Mr. Chair. That's the end of my questions. I just wanna say I support that last statement 100% and anything that you guys do that that writes into uh, the committee does or the legislature does that writes in that those public funds have to be passed on and can benefit that the uh, the end user is important to 
weave into that legislation, in my opinion. Uh, Representative Sims. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, this is so helpful to hear about the incredible partnership between uh, WECT and the, the CDs and your vision for serving um, everyone in your communities. You touched on this a little bit before, but um, in terms of um, the ability of co-ops to access funding that CUDs might not otherwise, um, I, I heard that potentially you guys are looking at the USDA Red Leg program as well. Is that correct? The program that offers 0% um, uh, interest loans that can be reloaned to businesses within your community. And um, are there other uh, resources that potentially WEC could tap into and make available to the CUD um, at, at competitive rates that the CUD might not be able to access otherwise. And so, so maybe more broadly, you know, do you see other ways that um, WEC can help um, support the financial viability of the CUD and are you exploring those? So one of, that's a great question. One of the things that we're going to continue to do is look for opportunities for grant funds. So right now we're planning to borrow through RUS for the full, the full amount that we need. But in the, um, in the interim, if we can, before we actually really start building and deploying, if we can find grant dollars, we'll use that to reduce an offset cost wherever possible, because that just helps lower the overall expense of the project, which ultimately gets passed on to the consumer for lower um, broadband fees, monthly fees for service. So we will continue to look for grants uh, wherever possible, and um, any any funds that we can tap um, to help this process and lower the cost, we'll be looking into that. So I just want to, um, in, in terms of the money that I hope will come down with this new administration uh, into the state for grants, if, if WEC can get some of that money, as Patty says, we don't actually um, draw, we don't if we get okay for $25 million, for instance, from our US, and we get some grant money that lowers that, we don't have to draw all that money down, okay? What we have had some conversations with, with the uh, CUDs are, we'll have to take a look, is it better for us to borrow that money in total and make sure the CUDs get more grant money because then we can still pass on that lower interest cost to them. So we'll, we're gonna work out a formula with them that anything we get in, in terms of grants or additional benefits, we're going, it's gonna lower what, what our uh, dollars per year per mile cost, lease cost is to them. So we'll have a, a movable, uh, a movable um, formula because one of the questions, for instance, at the end of 35 years, that lease will go down to zero with only the addition of what the additional operating costs might might be. Um, in terms of the red line, um, our uh, chief financial officer, director of financing, has been looking at the availability of that. It's It's got a little bit more complicated than the old 0% because we did loan a few communities. We funded the uh, pass-through for the skating rink in Montpelier, which some people may know because they had the outbreak of the COVID and also a uh, incubator project in Marshfield. So we're familiar with that and we are, we are gonna take a look at it. We're also looking at, um, there's, it's changed names a little bit, but there's a thing called the ReConnect program, or con uh, the Connect program. And depending on how that comes out, um, we may be able to get a grant out of, out of that money. Um, and if we did it, it would again lower that formula cost. So that the main goal is to lower the cost to the end consumer. That's what we're trying to do. But thank you. Those were good yeah, questions. Yeah, great. Thanks. I mean, I think what I find so um, interesting about the Red Leg program is the utilities receive the money and they turn around and then relend them to businesses like the CUD. And so that's great to hear that you're exploring how you might be able to access low cost capital and then relend that to the, the CUD and make funds available that they might not be able to access otherwise. So glad, yeah. glad you've already played that role for others yeah. um, and that you're exploring it for CUDs. And, and we didn't, we didn't have have, uh, I, I don't think we had any, but if we did, Avram would even know this because he was involved then. Um, 
but I don't think we had, we we added any charge at all to that pass through. The only thing we had to do is require that those entities uh, had some kind of letter or credit or something, so that we weren't stuck. We couldn't we couldn't guarantee that loan all week because if it, if they failed to make the payments, then we we were on the hook for it. So that, but Avram was can fill you in on on the details of that if he still remembers. <laughs> Uh, Representative Yantachka. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. Um, Patty and Barry, thank you for your presentation. And uh, your plan is to build out the fiber cabling only, right? And I know there's a difference between the technicians that actually uh, do the electrical work on the poles versus the ones that do the um, uh, broadband cabling, right? Yes. So, so are you going to need um, the broadband folks in order to do your part of the work? Or are you going to do that with your electrical folks and then let the broadband folks only do the drops to the premises? Patty, do you want me so, or do you want to? So in turn, I'll start and Barry, you can certainly jump in. Um, in terms of actually uh, stringing the fiber, our thought at this point, we don't have this, like, you know, this is all moving fast and furious. We don't have the specifics as to how we would string the fiber. The first step is to get the money from our US. Let's get that, then we're off and running. But um, there are uh, contract companies, Eustis is a common uh, entity out there. We would likely work with the CUDs in terms of, um, you know, who we would actually contract with to spring the fiber. Um, at this point, we're not planning to use our electrical workers because we have them fully deployed on electric work that we need to maintain our operation side on our um, infrastructure for electricity. Um, that said, it's not set in stone and we'll figure out the best way to deploy that and do that in a way that is we we get it done quickly and get it done in an affordable manner. So at this point, it's likely we'll contract out for that, but we will work with a CUD to um, make sure we're doing that in the appropriate fashion. Okay. Mike, one, one, of the, one of the models we've explored with um, Carol and Stan and uh, CV Fiber and Kingdom Fiber um, is that we would actually subcontract to them to be responsible for the in quotes in cooperation with us for the design and for the laying of the fiber, um, and then they would whoever whoever does it, we're going to be using somebody by you like Eustace because right now the only one in the state that does it. But what we want to do is each CUD might have a little or ISP might have a little different design that they want to incorporate in the areas they're serving. So if we can work with them and basically funnel the money for them to oversee it, then it gives them more control over the way they want to have it ended up. So that's one of the models we're exploring with them. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to meet with them every couple of weeks. The, um, the um, FCC model, the uh, RDOF thing has put everybody off a bit because everybody's working to try to get their next... Um, we didn't. We weren't actually a bidder, but we weren't a consortium with bidders. Consortium with bidders. So they're all just trying to get their uh, the paperwork in. But beginning of February, we're all meeting again to continue laying out this progression with the goal of the, the. Our goal is to be able to draw down funds by the fall of this year, so that we can get things done. And we one of the things we're doing a chicken and egg in is um, the actual final detail design, which is engineering design. We, if we're gonna pay for it with our US funding, we can't do that until we get the RUS funding. We may see if there's some grant money or another way of, of, of funneling that so we can get a step ahead. And, and WECO owns all the poles in your territory, right? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, so uh, are you planning to build out the fiber regardless of whether you have a commitment from uh, <clears throat> from your members to uh, subscribe to it? So we're not. Oh, go ahead, Patty. 
We estimate, we did a survey of our membership as part of the business uh, study, the business um, plan study that we did. And we're estimated a, a 45 to 55% take rate, which is very consistent with um, what the experience of the CUD's actual numbers are. So based on that survey, um, that's what we're, we're, we're planning to string to fiber for, you know, we're not doing a piecemeal. We're gonna do the entire, it, when we come to the town that we serve, we're gonna do all the polls. Um, and we anticipate 45 to 50%, 55% take rate. And based on the demands um, created due to the pandemic, we actually think the numbers likely will come in higher. So we do have that baked into our business model. Okay, Just, my last my last question oh, is, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Did you have something? To add no, on? yeah, I was just I was just gonna, gonna say, we're our 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 um, sticking point or where we have to come to an agreement is we have to, we need to know that the CUDs will lease the fiber that we build out because our model is based on having every mile that we build leased out. The take rate, which we're looking at and they're looking at, they're more confident. And all of us are relying to a large extent on Carol and Stan and Valley and EC Fiber because they have actual real life numbers. Uh, they are very confident, and as Patty pointed out, particularly with the COVID experience, that mm -hmm. that more people by the end of the fourth year are going to start to sign up than they might in the first. It's a graduated buildup over four years. Okay, and my last question actually might. Uh, pull in Brian Otley here. Um, would this model work with GMP? Um, uh, so the differences, the differences we have uh, with WEC are, um, you know, Patty, I forget the, de the numbers you put out. So, you know, I identified earlier a little over 7,500 locations with less than four. Patty, how many total members do you have in totals for electric service? So we have about 11 meters. Um, but 11, some of those 000. are redundant. So 11, call it 10,000 yeah. 10, locations and about 8,500, 8,000 to 8,500 that are in that underserved or unserved group. Right. So we've got similar populations of un, 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 un and under, you and you, un and underserved. Um, so the, sc the scale of doing what Patty is suggesting to do at GMP is, I, you know, what, I don't know what the factor is, 10x um, mm -hmm. because, of the, because of the line miles and the, the, you know, just the sheer reach of the geographic territory we would have to do. And so um, when we've looked at the analysis of, tr of trying to justify these costs against the energy system benefits they can deliver, um, at that scale, it doesn't, it doesn't pencil for us. It doesn't work for us. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're today in a position where we're trying to cause or be a catalyst for CUDs and other ISPs to, to do these builds and, and to offer cost uh, incentives in the area that we can directly control. Um, you know, WEC has, a, WEC has a, a different view of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess, Tim, uh, we don't have anybody from Vermont Electric Co-op here. So I was just wondering how that might Not unless they're apply. hiding someplace. No, we don't. <laughs> might apply to, to uh, their territory. So yep. uh, for a future question. Okay, yep. thanks. Ab absolutely. Um, Representative Pat. Uh, a couple of uh, just pieces of of uh, information uh, in terms of uh, WEX involvement. When I was uh, there with the, the Red Leg program and the two locations uh, Barry mentioned, it's, he's correct in both of those situations, um, the borrower, uh, which in, in both cases were a, a nonprofit or community uh, effort with huge amount of local community support. It wasn't, a, it wasn't just a, a small business. Um, in both those cases, it, re it required that the loan be completely guaranteed uh, by, uh, by a commercial bank, I believe in both, in both cases. Otherwise the, the co-op, uh, in, in the event there had been a default that would have gone right to the, the rate payers. Um, uh, and uh, um, 
I, I don't know their current status, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that because Vermont Electric Co-op uh, was in bankruptcy in the 1990s, when they came out of that, uh, uh, what was then still the Rural Electrification Administration forbid them to, from ever borrowing from them again. And I, and I don't know if that covenant still um, exists, but they have been using other financing other than uh, some of the things that uh, Washington Electric Co-op is, is eligible for. But my question uh, is, um, uh, in his testimony, uh, Brian uh, talked about the um, uh, when, when the uh, inter internet service is not, um, is not uh, sufficient, uh, it may, means that the, the customer can't take advantage of certain types of um, uh, load management or other kinds of um, uh, uh, programs that, that Green Mountain Power offers. I know Washington Electric Co-op also offers some um, uh, load management um, uh, programs, including um, elect uh, involving electric hot water heat. Um, and in promoting that, the promotions will say uh, condition, the con one of the conditions for participating is that you must have um, internet service. Uh, uh, and I'm just wondering what uh, WEX experience has been in terms of how many people, uh, if you know, might not be participating who other otherwise would be if, if, uh, because of connectivity issues. Yeah, we're running a small pilot and peak load control devices. And you know, I'm gonna emphasize small, we have less than a hundred members using it. Um, and Avram, you're spot on. One of the conditions that we require is that they have internet service and they, they can have clunky internet service because it's a programming thing that pings to their meter to say, hey, turn off at these, we want you to turn off at a particular time frame to help us control for peak. Um, but it's very few customers, A, that even uh, put their hand up to participate, and then B, there are limitations because of the access to the internet. They at least have to have, uh, you know, the four to one megabytes per second speed. And we can work with that in terms of this, the, the simplistic peak control that we're using in this program. But to do some of the more sophisticated things down the road, like GMP is doing, ultimately, we would have to have uh, high-speed internet to do, you know, really more sophisticated peak load control programs. And, you know, we're balancing that with the fact that WEC members generally <coughs> lag behind um, the rest of the state just because of income disparity and our service territory is a little bit more low income. So we're, we're a lagger. The EV adoption rate is not as high as, you know, a more wealthy county, just that's the basic premise. Uh, but ultimately, any, doing any peak load control or uh, control device programs will need high-speed internet uh, in the future. So this is the deployment of fiber is a futuristic um, infrastructure need that we will have. You know, being able to quantify it at this point is difficult, but we can say there is some um, new things that we can do and new uh, program savings we could achieve down the road. Avram, I'm I'm part of that program on a volunteer basis since I'm on the board, but I have I'm underserved. I have less than a megawatt uh, uh, upload, and um, but it, it still works with the uh, hot water heat pump I put in. Um, so, but if I wanted to do more, uh, it'd be more difficult. The other thing, and Patty has because uh, we're lo looking at time of use programs, which which this will help us to offer in the future. But as you know, our average usage per member is like 450 kilowatt hours a month. So people who are using that little aren't necessarily rushing to do the demand side. And we're also a winter peak as opposed to summer peak. But as people move off of fossil fuels onto... Um, uh, air source heat pumps, for instance, that load will pick up and it will be more beneficial for them to do it. I will just put one little comment here in that when we talk to our members about using air source heat pumps, uh, we don't give any rebate to them if their house isn't 
insulated, weatherized appropriately, because we don't want them to put something on that's not going to be efficient because they've got a lot of holes in the wall. So we're trying to make sure still that we follow the thing that you and I have been involved in for so long is still to get people to use electricity wisely. Uh, when I hear this thing, and I'll just, this is a little off uh, this subject, but when I hear that Hummer is coming out with an electric vehicle, I, I say, well, okay, well, how much power are they going to be using? Because it's, there's only so much resources we're going to have if we're going to deal with climate change. And we just can't be stupid about how we do things. So, sorry. You're going to need but, three uh, roofs full of uh, solar panels to power that Hummer. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and exactly. 120 grand. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks for the so, information. Um, I'll, we I'll have, wait. We, we have one more uh, guest this morning, um, but uh, for the chair's uh, good lumbar health, which is uh, this chair, not the chair I'm sitting in, although probably both, um, I, I would like to take a three minute uh, break, literally only three minutes, just so folks can stretch. Um, my time on my screen says 1038. Uh, so we're gonna start back up at 1041. So if everyone could, could mute their device, thank you. So uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, indulging the chair for a quick stretch there. Um, so batting cleanup today, uh, we have Carrick Johnson, who's the um, VP for Strategic Innovation at Velco. Um, really appreciate you joining us today, Carrick. We, uh, we have been in conversation in this committee with you and, and also um, offline uh, with you about this issue for, for months and months now. And I know Velco is doing a lot of work here, so really appreciate you taking a few minutes today to um, fill us in on some of the things that Velco is doing. And, and um, this has been a great conversation we're having and, and excited to, to have you here. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me see, um, I've been working with Matt. Let me see if I can call this up and then go here. Yep, that's coming up on my screen. Okay, I'm just trying to go there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thought that, um, both Brian and Patty, an excellent work. This is a little bit different, right? We are the, the. let me just see, are you seeing the, the front page? Because I have two monitors, or are you- We, we are, we're, we're seeing page uh, number one. It's got House Energy and Technology perfect. Committee on it. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think that uh, Brian and Patty and Barry uh, did an excellent work. I have, I am grateful for the ability and the, uh, uh, to work with both of them. And uh, as you say, Mr. Chairman, we've been, working quite a bit on this. So let me just jump to it uh, since I'm mindful of time. But uh, as I said, though, Velcro is a different creature. We're a little bit different creature. And th the nice thing is you've heard from Green Mountain Power, the state's largest utility, and Washington Electric Co-op, one of the smaller utilities, and uh, a utility of which I happen to be a member. And I'm grateful for Barry and Patty's leadership. Um, seriously, very grateful for that leadership, especially on this issue. Um, a little bit about Velcro. Velcro was founded in 1956. Vermont has a lot of these first things. Another first thing is Velcro, Vermont Electric Power Company. It was the first transmission only company founded in the US. We were created because there were all these unconnected local utilities and there was an opportunity and thank you to Senator Aiken who got some federal dollars to help states contiguous to New York gain access to uh, significantly less expensive power that would be generated from the dams along the St. Lawrence. So we were able, so our genesis, our founding story was help us connect to deliver renewable energy. So we built a power line from the border, just outside of the border of Vermont into Vermont and interconnected all the, there's 54 utilities at the time to connect Vermont's 54 distribution utilities at the time. Uh, that was our founding. Right now, our vision, um, this will be interesting if some of you have a reaction to it. We're a utility, but our job really is we look at it as to create a sustainable Vermont because essentially we're a utility owned by utilities and a public benefits corporation. So it's a different construct. That construct is remains unique in Vermont. Our primary role ensure grid reliability. But if you see the responsibilities there, the local control center, fundamental blocking and tackling grid, grid operations. We also develop and submit a long range transmission plan. That requirement was born out of pain and anguish. Uh, we more than quintupled our assets a few years ago. 
built a very large transmission line after 20 years of not building any transmission. And we happen to have built it along, the, uh, along Lake Champlain in some of the most affluent communities in the state, some of the most engaged communities in the state. And we upset a lot of people. And part of that was because they felt surprised. So the idea was how do we give full, fair and timely consideration of non-wires solutions? There is no uh, transmission utility that works harder to not put up additional iron in the ground uh, than I would say than uh, Velcro. But we also uh, run the Vermont System Planning Committee. That group is to share what's going on in transmission, but also effectively can serve as a, if not the kitchen, maybe the breakfast nook of the Vermont energy world. That's where we discuss and engage, uh, engages regulators, renewable energy companies, the utilities, uh, commercial interests, uh, community interests, um, all those 16, 17 stakeholders all around what's going on with energy. So it's an interesting group. I can talk more about that. Then lastly, we manage a regional utility issues group for the Department of Public Service. Vermont's one of six states that comprise the New England uh, Independent System Operator Region, one of six states. Vermont's pretty small. We are only effective if we collaborate and unite around a, on a given topic and advocate that together, a team Vermont approach. Our job is to help unite and try and gain consensus and then advocate that position. So we work with the department to do that. And we've been very successful. Uh, we like to think we do definitely punch above our, our overall um, megawatt weight. Let's keep going. <clears throat> There's been a lot of discussion about for-profit not the co-op structure. Uh, I can tell you, we are imbued with that public interest. Fundamentally here, we are a for-profit company, which we are, but we're organized to deliver benefits like a co-op. We are owned, all the assets in Vermont are owned by the Vermont Distribution Utilities and Velco. Velco is the operating committee, excuse me, operating entity for all these assets. But Velco itself is owned by the Distribution Utilities and the Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity, a public benefits corporation. Uh, that public benefits corporation, their job is to get a million dollars a year, and their job is to name three people to serve on the Velco board, as well as to take the million dollars and advance the goals of the comprehensive energy plan. So a public benefits corporation and the leaders of the distribution utilities and the like, that's who sits on our board. That's our governance. So our motive, our motive is how do we keep the grid reliable and how can we um, serve our owners? our customer owners, and how can we help create a sustainable Vermont? Effectively, our mission consists of our mission and vision uh, work, as I said. Make sure no one gets hurt, first and foremost. Secondly, keep the lights on, keep the, the transmission the lights on, since we serve all of the state's 17 distribution utilities. Um, continue to find ways to deliver value. That includes trying to, I think Brian had mentioned this, um, we've had a nominally flat budget for the last seven years. Our headcount has stayed the same for the last nine years. That is not easy to do in this time of transformation. But we know one of the most critical things we can do is not cost too much, even as we seek to get better at our job. So that's one way we do live value, but we're also seeking to find ways to leverage the assets we have, everything from bucket trucks to uh, a new thing that was developed, an app, an app to manage mats, mats that we put on the ground so heavy equipment goes over to protect wetlands, threatened endangered species and the like. So it runs the gamut of how we deliver value. And lastly is that policy advocacy as I talked about. That's at the regional level, sometimes that's at the state level, sometimes that's on the national level, um, as in Congress when we talk about such issues as broadband. So I wanted to share, Mr. Chairman, as you and I have talked about, this is just a quick snapshot and you'll have this presentation. Let me just give some love to Matt because I think I've sent him three different presentations since we've started as you have tripped me on some stuff. I have two slides here. Fundamentally, it is um, so timely that this committee, Mr. Chairman, is working on this. I'll, I have two slides here. 33 states are already doing where utilities have a role largely Cooperatives, but not in every case, are engaged in delivering broadband services in some, in some shape, manner, or form to their customers. 33 states across the nation, and this is not comprehensive. And that's either 
already happening or they're moving and they're getting after it right now. So this is absolutely something that is timely, uh, if not overdue. So here's the second one, just to give you a feel for the additional states. And I just got that information this morning. And again, it is a snapshot that is not represented as comprehensive, but it's a very good handle of all the states and what's going on in the convergence of utility service with broadband service delivery. Okay, um, a little bit about us. One thing about Velcro, uh, generally speaking, if you're not hearing about us, that means we're doing our job. Uh, because fundamentally, if you're going to hear about us, usually it's because uh, something not so pleasant might have happened. But fundamentally, we have, as I mentioned, more than quintupled our transmission assets, while we have uh, at least expanded by fourfold our fiber network. Uh, we have about 1,500 miles of 72-strand fiber. Uh, you, see the, you can see the other uh, information there. Uh, what effectively what that does is it buys down the cost. As we reach deeper into community, it buys down the cost for other internet service providers for our distribution utility owners to pick up where that data transfer is happening and be able to drive down that cost because we're closer to them uh, effectively. We also, I just wanna note here, we have a statewide radio system for emergency purposes that enables the state 17 distribution utilities and Velcro to communicate with each other on a common communication platform, again, to help keep the lights on. So what do we do this? Um, we built this uh, grid network about 10 going on 12 years ago. And I should tell you, Mr. Sherman, at the time, it was viewed as a huge risk building. Why would a utility build a fiber network? Certainly, why would a, build, would a utility build a fiber network with 72 strands of capacity? That was considered in the industry a huge overbuild, unnecessary. However, in that time now, the CEO of, the CEO of ISO New England and their COO, uh, Gordon Van Wheely and uh, Vamsi Chada Lovada, respectively, have now will be coming to Velco in, um, I think in March, early March, because they have, they have identified that the but the construct Velco has put in place not only ensures better grid reliability and better data security, but it also helps address this issue on convergence, Mr. Chairman, that your committee is going after. So uh, at the time, it was risky 10 or 12 years ago. Now all the utilities are seeking to do, or excuse me, many utilities are seeking to do some type of uh, data, some type of fiber network. So what are we doing with ours? Well, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Yantashka mentioned Vermont Electric Co-op. Well, both for Vermont Electric Co-op um, co and Green Mountain Power, our fiber network is utilized for their um, real-time operations. It's called their SCADA network. Their control room, the ability to see what's going on is because of, in part, because of the network they utilize, our service to them to be able to make that happen. That's in addition to doing the data backhaul for all utilities. We do the data back all for all utilities and there's specific use cases we do uh, for individual utilities as is the case with DEC and GMP for that real-time operation. For Washington Electric Co-op, we just recently completed a pretty exciting um, project where we showed, so uh, for Washington Electric, for the first time they were able to, able to see in real time visualization of their data on some particular, just a subset, a subset of their assets. So think of all the savings or excuse me, the better, no better knowledge is better safety, is better customer response, or in this case, member response at Washington Electric Co-op. The really powerful stuff, which we're just starting to do with Washington Electric uh, Co-op. For Burlington Electric Department, they've now reached out to us and we're gonna be doing data hosting for them at a data center that I'll get into a little bit that we've just built. And then for Lindenville and Stowe, we've created an app for them to access the data we provide. It's their data, but we can visualize it for them such that on the both for Burke Mountain and the uh, Burke Mountain and the ski areas in Stowe, they can monitor. Okay, here comes peak load. Let's try and drive down our use, including in some cases snow guns and the like, to try and drive down and, and do some peak load shaving, such that they can save money. Overall, again, that has great uh, data security. Fundamentally, though, and our experience and our judgment based on what we've done, there is no true innovation without high speed, high volume, real-time communication, I should add, and highly reliable. 
if you don't have the ability to move data, to move information fast, reliably, uh, to where it needs to go and in the format it needs to be, you cannot continue to innovate. You can't decarbonize, you can't better provide service. We have experienced that. We learned that through building a fiber optic ne network system, the radio system, with VEC and Washington Electric Co-op and our other members, Vermont now has about 92 to 94% deployment of smart meters. Buck has also installed a high performance computing cluster, which we're starting to really tap into, but frankly, we're gonna use some uses for that, but mostly stuff is going for the cloud and we can still say secure, but uh, that's where most of the uh, data is going. As I mentioned, we've built a, a, it's a crazy data center if, um, God forbid, North Korea or someone else um, detonated a huge nuclear bomb over North America. Our the one remaining structure perhaps might be the Velco data center. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but it's a impregnable data center that we've built. And lastly, in case you had not known, based on the collaboration of Washington Electric Co-op and Green Mountain Power and our other distribution utility owners, Along with IBM and Boston Consulting Group, Velco, Velco actually created a successful startup analytics company uh, that was purchased by Vestas, the world's largest wind turbine company, uh, for about $100 million. So that brought, again, additional revenues to the state. In all these cases, the fiber network that we build, 20% um, of that cost, because we're a transmission only utility, 20% of the cost is paid for by Vermonters. 80% of the costs are paid for by the regions, the rest of the New England's, the other five New England states uh, uh, ratepayers. That is because that in generally speaking reflects both the percentage of the load, Vermont is at peak, which is roughly 4% of peak load of New England. And the fact again, that we're 100% transmission, uh, no distribution. Um, in addition, what's important about this, is that currently Vermont is able, Velco is able to capture 100% of the revenues generated by any additional work, any additional initiative that utilizes fiber network. The region pays 80% of it because it's for system reliability, Vermont pays 20%. But by, um, by precedent, by regulatory agreement, we're able to keep 100% of the monies generated through any creative use of that that doesn't compromise system reliability. That's gonna change. So that 100% will drop to 30% of any monies we generate. But still, if we're paying 20% for the asset and we still keep a third of the revenues generated, and I'll be happy, that's still a great uh, opportunity. Specifically with regards to our work on broadband coverage, um, probably I would say beginning in early March and thereabouts, we really dove in and we're working to try to help uh, worked very closely with the Department of Public Service, and I give Commissioner Tierney a lot of credit for her and her team, for her vision and leadership on this issue. Um, we worked, I mean, I got to know Michael Birnbaum and Luke Bobian, and we effectively, Velco's role was to connect people we were aware of in our network with people who didn't know each other, and just simply try to leverage our fiber network, leverage our substation assets where we could lend a hand. And I think we did, for instance, the, I think you've probably read a lot about, and I believe Ed McNamara might have talked about this, the, uh, the uh, project up in the Northeast Kingdom uh, with Luke Bobian and uh, Michael Birnbaum are doing with uh, their partners. that will connect about 300, um, 300 additional uh, families. Um, they're leveraging our assets um, to where we've effectively allowed them to have free space and leverage our work with Vermont Public Television in order to make that happen. So that's kind of the quiet behind the role scenes uh, we play, for instance, in that state level. There's federal funding opportunities. Um, at the current time, I can't talk about most of those, but in terms of working with the congressional uh, delegation to try and bring additional broadband dollars to the state, we've been working in particular with Senator Leahy's staff to try and make that happen. And again, working with the state um, Department of Public Service to see if there's ways we can get that to come and then how might that be used uh, if we were ready. Uh, I guess I would say as well as yourself, Mr. Chairman. And finally, um, if there's something the hard, um, cold fact is, whatever happens, if you pass legislation, great. If we get additional federal dollars, wonderful. 
we, regardless of that, we are moving forward on our fiber reliability project to expand by between three and 500 miles our existing 1500 mile uh, network. We're doing that because, because the kinds of um, changes to the grid that we all seek. I think Brian talked about decarbonization. How do we accelerate that? Velcro's role, um, and you saw very different uh, use cases and approaches between WEC and GMP. Our role is to build a common network, that innovation platform, such that every one of our owners, every utility has equal access, has a way to, at their own speed, given their own capital structure, can avail themselves of that to advance their own particular goals. Well, at the federal level though, what's what the, one of the major factors driving our fiber reliability project is Vermont, like Hawaii and California. Uh, we're very blessed with a, a substantial and growing number of distributed renewable uh, sources of generation. That's excellent. It does cause some challenges though. We have to keep evolving the grid in order to keep reliable. So uh, the North American Reliability Corporation, NERC, they're effectively the grid police. Um, they monitor your performance, and if you fail, they can issue penalties, and they're significant, million dollars a day per violation. They are now requiring, they've gotten it, these uh, smaller scale distributed renewable generators have reached such scale that they impact the transmission grid, the higher level transmission grid, and they're requiring utilities to have better vision, better data into their systems to understand what's connected, where it is, and when it's on, and when it's off. So for our purposes, that gives us an opportunity and a requirement to expand our fiber uh, reliability project. As I said, we're in the midst of designing that. Uh, we informed that we uh, actually organized. I think if, if it wasn't the first, yeah, I think it might have been the first gathering of all the CUD statewide to try and get them to say, here's who we are. Here's what we can do for you. And we have this project that's coming. Let's see if we can collaborate. So that work is ongoing. Um, we expect to have a design uh, approved. We would, um, we're hopeful uh, to begin on that, say, third quarter of this year to get moving on that project. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to know, I think it was um, a Representative Rogers talking about her town and the like. And just to bring it back, like what this is all about here, this is something the Vermont Community Foundation did. Uh, red is bad in this map. <laughs> effectively, which communities are in the most distress? And you can agree or disagree with the factors, but it's something we're, we're um, aware of. And I think Brian might have mentioned, you look at the communities in real distress and it does largely in some instances track with, uh, among the things that it tracks with or coincides with, lack of ability, uh, lack of broadband uh, connectivity. This is the kind of stuff we look at to say, uh, how are we being as creative as possible to keep our costs down and keeps our creative juices flowing. Um, so this is something, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to share because this is something that's front and center on our leadership team for the people working on convergent on, in, in terms of delivering broadband, ensuring system reliability, and a host of other kind of innovative things. And with that, I'll stop and be glad to answer questions. Thank you, Carrick. That was terrific uh, and, and a great, um, uh, you know, a great segue through the different presentations this morning, um, and you, you tied it together as our transmission utility does as a state uh, tie a lot of this together. Um, we've got one hand up right now. Um, Representative Yantachka, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, Velco, as you said, is a transmission utility. Uh, your fiber, pro well, I, you don't have poles per se that. Uh, that this that uh, CUDs or any other ISP ISPs would be attaching to, right? Correct. So your your fiber is going only to um, other distribution utilities like WEC, GMP, and so forth. Yeah, effectively, it goes to our transmission substations. Excuse me, all of our transmission substations, as well as connecting a host of our statewide radio sites. The project so, we're talking about, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, so, so I was gonna ask how, how does uh, a distribution utility like WEC or <clears throat> GMP or Vel um, Vermont Electric Co-op take advantage of the fiber that you're providing and yeah. Well, the, 
the sub transmission uh, sites that we connect to um, as uh, they have connections there because it is sub transmission because it's starting to be stepped down to the voltage levels that the distribution uh, levels need to. So there's various points of connection where transmission meets distribution and that's how they, they get connected. And this project we're talking about now that's underway, again, again, driven by a number of factors, including these emerging NERC standards, is such that will be look like we'll be connecting to an additional 400 distribution substations plus uh, key storage sites, um, assets on the grid that make a difference that we need vision into. So there'll be a whole nother space of connections will be closer to them for more direct communication. So for instance, WEC, the, the reason why we have the ability to do the work we're doing with WEC right now is because that connection, we have connection points to them, whether it's a sub-transmission system or a, we're down to their distribution system, um, they're, effectively that's where they're connected. Michael. Okay, so, <clears throat> so how does that tie into uh, fiber to the premises? Uh, it, it, Velco wouldn't be directly involved in that, but would uh, a utility like WEC connecting to your network, would that serve in some indirect way for fiber to the premises? Indirect, you're absolutely, we don't, um, <clears throat> our line of jurisdiction clearly ends at the, where the distribution level starts. We don't get into last mile where you can't really touch our poles. We're effectively the limited access super highway. And if you can get on to us, then you get out to the world, uh, effectively, I would say, Michael. That's our kind of role. So again, the closer we get that, the closer the on-ramp to this uh, data superhighway is to where the distribution utility needs to be, the lower the cost, the easier it is to connect. The distribution utility has different, as you've heard, different business cases, different constructs for how they're going to get from that point of connection to the last mile, whether they build or they they issue a, an RFP or have someone else build. Our job is to get as get that super highway as deep in the community as possible, to drive down the cost and increase system reliability. Okay, and then I, my last question has doesn't have to do with broadband at all, but uh, one of your slides said, uh, the, the one with the circle on it, um, yeah. Yeah. that your EMP protected, your, your, dis, your data centers are EMP protected, which is electromagnetic pulse protected in what kind of protections do you actually have? I mean, how, how is that protected? It's, it is a, there's only one data center that is, <laughs> see, I'm like the worst person to, I'll answer the question. I'm the worst <laughs> person to ask because I said, what the hell are we doing? So it is a data, <laughs> it's effectively in this concrete box that has this beyond rebar that's, and Dan, our, our uh, vice president for technology, Dan also would speak better to it. But effectively it's, um, a data center that has all kinds of protection built into the walls that's further on a cement um, in, encased with specific types of rebar in that um, that, that's located at the plant. So it is what I call it, six, six levels of protection that's around it. So again, if you're in there, you'll survive a, a nuclear attack. I don't know if you'll answer the door if someone knocks, but it's there. And that's the only, the only data center that is thusly protected, represented the untouched. Yeah, and uh, apart from nuclear attacks, the solar flares are also a source yes. of electromagnetic, electromagnetic pulse. Too. You're absolutely right. And I understand that we just entered the latest 11-year cycle for those things. So I'm, I'm with you. It's just that's a uh, going right. to have bigger thank problems you. than there if, if that happens. <laughs> that, was a, that was just personal curiosity. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, so... I will give the, I don't see any other hands up signal in case anyone else has a question. Um, but I, I just wanna wrap this up with a thank you for our four guests. Um, this was really helpful to me and I hope members of the committee because uh, as Carrick had said, uh, Green Mountain Power and Washington Electric Co-op are very different um, uh, electric utilities in our state, but also very focused on uh, broadband, broadband deployment and acceleration of that rollout um, because it helps what they do in serving their customers. And I think that's a really important point, um, you know, from a reliability standpoint, uh, from a resilience standpoint, from a cost saving standpoint, from a carbon reduction standpoint, we can go on and on here. Um, and we've been pretty focused on 
um, some of the discrete advantages of broadband in recent weeks. This kind of brings us into another sector, which is extremely important and obviously also part of our, um, uh, you know, part of the world that this committee deals in, which is which is the energy world. So I really appreciate that and, and Kara kind of drawing this together as to how this connects um, from a transmission utility standpoint as well. And then the other thing that I want to note is uh, an appreciation for um, a couple of policy initiatives that have been brought to our attention um, by Green Mountain Power and, um, and by WEC as well, things that we might consider as part of a broadband bill, again, that we're gonna start working on next week and um, you know, push into February. I've had conversations with the speaker about what her expectations are um, in terms of how quickly we might bring, uh, bring something to the floor of the house on this. There's, um, uh, there's a lot of interest from members uh, across the state on, on this particular issue. So this was really helpful in tying some of this together. Um, just one other general comment I wanna to bring to the um, committee's attention. Yesterday, I had mentioned that for tomorrow's discussion in committee, um, we were going to have a discussion on budget adjustment and the climate council. Um, Secretary Moore had brought um, information to our attention yesterday. We are gonna have a discussion tomorrow, 15 minutes after the floor. So I think we're gonna have a brief floor session in the morning. I think it starts at 9.30. I, I don't expect that there will go you know, much more than a half an hour, although I, haven't, uh, I don't know what's on the calendar at this point, but we're gonna have that discussion about budget adjustment 15 minutes after the floor tomorrow. And then um, we're gonna have our afternoon session. And I think, well, I, I, I'm, uh, I don't know how long that will go, um, but again, 15 minutes after the floor. And then in the afternoon, we have a 1.30, um, hearing that uh, is going to be the second half of our master's degree um, process from the Department of Public Service on, um, on energy programs in the state, renewable energy services, um, uh, standard offer, um, net metering, um, all, all those fun things. Um, so that's gonna start at 1.30, just to give um, members kind of situational awareness as to what we're gonna be doing tomorrow. So um, any comments from the committee or questions or anything else before we wrap up for today? Don't see any. Mr. Hands. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. So I, I would uh, just like to echo um, thanks to our utilities for, um, for digging in here and uh, really thinking about how we can uh, innovate. Uh, in particular, uh, Velco, uh, both Carrick and, and his uh, you know, predecessor uh, have been engaged in this conversation for a number of years, really um, trying to help uh, folks around the state think about uh, how do we get this job done. So I think uh, that, that, um, that public thinking with all of us about getting this job done is, is really appreciated, so. Great, 